So I think the task is a much bigger task than simply decolonizing knowledge or decolonizing a curriculum. It's really understanding the imperial and colonial past um, of institutions of knowledge in the UK and the extent to which they are seriously implicated in oppression, racism, sexism, and the subjugation of and disappearance of peoples, the oppression of peoples um, around the world. I think that's a heavier burden uh, that institutions must also engage in alongside these you know, activities around knowledge, curriculum, pedagogy, thinking critically, um, engaging in research, um, engaging in the world. And so I start my uh, talk with you know, pondering those questions. I don't have all the answers, um, but I think we will never find answers if we don't ask questions and don't ask the, the right kinds of questions. So in my work, I always, um, when I'm teaching um, around research, uh, the matter of framing, the way we think about things is really important. You know, I, I recently described Western knowledge <clears throat> as a little bit like porridge. You know, it's something I grew up on, porridge. It's comfortable and it's dodgy, but it fills your belly. Even though you know it's not completely nutritious, it doesn't fill your spirit. Maybe unless you're Scottish, which I partly am, which is why I've chosen the concept of porridge, but it kind of like a comfort food that fills you so you can function, but it's not fulfilling in terms of you, what you know the world could be. And um, the, the real challenge for someone like me who works in the Indigenous space is to understand the extent uh, to which Western knowledge has been so much part of my own upbringing, my own um, socialization, and, and definitely my education. So I've come through as a, you know, a generation of Indigenous scholars really deeply trained in Western theories and methodologies. You know, I start, studied history um, as an undergraduate. I didn't just do a major in history. I did a major in history and a minor in history and a, and a major in uh, political studies. Um, I came back and did a master's degree in counseling and hated it. And so switched to sociology of education and then enrolled and somebody asked me what my discipline was. You know, and I really had to think about, do, do I have a discipline? To, why do I need a discipline? Um, what, what do you mean by discipline? And really that just did my head in for about two years while I thought about what my PhD might be on. Um, and I just said, look, I just want to, I just want to talk about our views, my people's, my community's understandings of education. I want to look at what we value in education. And, um, and so that started really the work that um, I've been thinking about and, and that informed the Decolonising Methodologies uh, book. So what am I saying? Well, what I'm saying is it's really hard to get rid of knowledge that's in you because it is so much part of the way um, the blood circulates through your body, as part of your veins, as part of the way you think. And yet the very task of decolonizing knowledge is actually to think about how can you reframe what you know? How can you create space in what you know for new ways of knowing? And how can you embrace those new ways of knowing knowing the very skills you've been taught um, 
uh, st often stand in the way. So how do you open yourself up without really um, kind of losing your sense of gravity or losing uh, your sense of um, security? Because in a sense, it will make you insecure because that's what everything we've been taught formally in institutions gives us. It gives us the certain stability around knowledge, um, around the way we've been taught, around the rules um, of how knowledge is understood. So to step off into something else um, is always risky, risky at a personal level, um, but also risky in terms of you know, what, what it is you think you're doing, because it's, it can be dangerous uh, in the sense that you can fall um, and not really know what you can hang on to. So it's decolonizing work to me then has to be really purposeful. It's not simply going in blind and saying, well, we're going to decolonize knowledge in in a you know in an institution or in a department or in a discipline or in a particular field with really without really having some steps about how you're going to do that um, and without recognizing that you're in there because of the knowledge that you have that all of us are there because we you know for someone like me of credentials uh, from a university so I, I know the value system uh, in terms of the way universities work. And yet everything that we're trying to do is question all of that. So I think there's a practical set of um, steps that we have to think through, as well as some theoretical ideas about what you, you and others and, and certainly what we've tried to do here that help take, not only help create change and trans, a transformational sort of approach um, in an institution, but helps take other people with you because that's one of the other challenges is, I mean, it's the role of hegemony at one level, or hegemony, um, but there are many people, even many indigenous people uh, who would find it deeply troubling to reject something that's been oppressive to them, to reject Western knowledge, even though it has excluded them and actively oppressed them in many ways, it is still scary frightening um, to try and remove it or try and get rid of it or decolonize it, whatever the word is. So we're playing in quite a, um, you know, and Franz Fanon talks about um, this in terms of the, the sort of violence really of colonialism and the violence of decolonialism. It has a violence to it, it's a psychological violence. And I think as educators, our role is to really understand that process of, um, you know, it's a epistemological violence, but it still hurts. It still creates emotional vulnerability. It challenges someone's essence of who they are, their identity. And in doing that, there is this sort of sense of, a violence to, um, to who they are, their sense of self. Um, so they're really, I guess I'm problematizing uh, this because we've been through different iterations of attempts to address, say, racism and sexism over you know, through the 1970s. Some of you may not have been born then, but I was around. Uh, there was a second wave of feminism in New Zealand. 
It was the beginning of the Māori sovereignty movement, which I was part of, certainly the gay liberation, the anti-Vietnam War. It was quite a pivotal time uh, for my generation. But for the sort of waking up of um, a whole lot of political ideas, you know, about what we thought society um, should be like. And at that time, I think we were just reacting to what it was like. Our vision, maybe where the polit political groups I was part of was different from, say, the um, feminist groups and uh, gay liberation groups was we really had a clear vision of what New Zealand should look like constitutionally in terms of our treaty, but we didn't really know what that would look like for everyday life, for what it would mean, you know, when we got our freedom back, what would that mean? Um, we really had to think through that with every change and initiative that we did. So I think what I've learned from that is change, positive change creates opportunities for more change. You don't go to um, the ideal state in, in an instant, right? It's a big journey and um, you don't, can't even see uh, the, you know, the um, possibilities that are open to you unless you start the journey. You can't go on that journey alone. Uh, a, it will wear you down. Every activist will tell you that. Uh, it wears you down. And also, if you don't have support, then you don't have, a, um, in contemporary terms, a supply chain um, of new generational support, but also basic things that you need uh, to mount these sort of campaigns. So the support of other people is really important and probably the most challenging because even ones who you think uh, would be supportive, who'd come on the journey with you for different reasons, um, they don't. Some of them are afraid and they turn back or they stand still. Others uh, doubt themselves and doubt you uh, and doubt the project. Others um, just don't have the fortitude for it. Uh, others come to discover that that's not the journey they want to be on. So there are different reasons for that, for why people abandon the struggle, but the reality is many of them do. Uh, we learned in the 1980s in New Zealand and 1990s with many of our anti-racism um, programs that, you know, anti-racism programs can create racists who are more sophisticated and who've had access to resources, um, a new language and networks, but they're not, they don't, they don't complete the cycle of um, anti-racism. I think we learned in New Zealand that building anti-racist anti-racism programs or white guilt is not effective. Um, for someone like me, I find white guilt just gets in the way. I'm not really interested in their guilt. Um, I think for many people, they get lost in that sense of guilt and can't find the sort of you know, practical steps that they need to do to live a different kind of life. And I think that's, you know, I keep coming back to this sense of being practical about things that you have to start your journey in the morning by getting up, opening your door, walking out the door, step by step by step. And if um, our, our programs of decolonizing or anti-racism that, can't help people do that, then people are going to be stuck. So I've, I have taken some notes uh, down about just simple things. And I'd start with the fact that um, this is a diversity 
um, reading list kind of network. And just want to acknowledge you, Simon, and you know, for starting this and, and others who participated. That of course, when we're <clears throat> talking about scholarship and knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're reading really matters. And um, it, to me, there's, because I live in this rich world of indigenous literature, and literature by, you know, black scholars and <clears throat> scholars of color. So to me, that's no, a normal, all right? But when I started as an undergraduate student, there was, that was not a normal. That, there was a complete absence of literature that I was introduced to at university. I read Franz Fanon with friends in the cafeteria. And I, made, I often talk about majoring in cafeteria studies um, because that's where I came across this alternative literature um, that started to inspire me. It was not off the reading lists in my history classes or politics classes um, or any other courses that I was aware of um, at university in the 1970s. There was nothing in the reading lists. But we're still, even when, <clears throat> even when they weren't addressing <clears throat> um, Māori issues. So in history, they talk about colonialism. And now you can think back, how could they have talked about colonialism without mentioning that they actually colonized people and those colonized people had names and those colonized people had, had countries, had territories that you now occupy. And that was the thing that did our head in, in history classes is sitting in a, in a class been told about the history of your country in New Zealand and your everything you know is absent. Your own stories are absent, your people are absent and they're not mentioned. You know, that, I mean, so you go from a class that does that or a university curriculum that does that over to a cafeteria, student cafeteria, and um, we read Fanon um, and start to, and then that was the era of Malcolm X and, um, you know, all this <clears throat> alternative radical writing that started to begin to nourish us in different ways. This was the extra bit, not the porridge bit. This was starting to give us meat and vegetables, you know, some of the, more, the proteins and things that um, started to pick us up and give us energy. So reading and um, referencing is really important. And I think for those of you who teach, it's probably the most practical thing you can do is decolonize your reading lists and begin to actively um, shape your reading lists to give voice to certain ideas, um, to provide a different kind of language for talking about these ideas, because that's the other legacy of being um, erased from history, is in being erased, what disappears is a language for talking about your existence because you don't exist and you don't need a language. So we also have to bring back a language for talking about these issues um, and a practical language, not a like 25 syllable word that ordinary people can't pronounce because it's so theoretical. No, these have to be kind of real words that our ordinary people can grasp and understand. Um, and, and they will get it. So reading lists, citation practices. No use giving students reading lists that are radical or you know, alternative or provide different um, diversity of thinking um, if 
in your writing and in the writing you expect of others, it keeps defaulting back to the great white heroes of the disciplines or the sort of, you know, dominant um, discussions inside a particular discipline. You know, how you're often having to reference this is, these are the key debates, you know, in this arena. Well, they're not really the key debates if you're thinking about um, decolonizing the agenda. Those are the key debates that continue to colonize um, some of these uh, ways of thinking. I think our citation practices have to be really deliberate. I know, um, you know, in my field, it was very difficult <clears throat> 20 years ago to cite other Indigenous authors. Um, but now there's no excuse in Indigenous studies not to cite predominantly Indigenous um, writers and to be very deliberate about that. Because as you know, that links in then to um, sort of the whole sort of research performance, measurement, all that, all that rubbish um, is all tied into citation practices and who gets published. I think the sort of decentering, often I think when we're talking about decolonizing, people mean a, a kind of decentering of what traditionally is counted as important. It's not necessarily getting rid of entirely, but it's reorganizing what it is that we do and removing from the center um, some of the obsessions, you know, that the center has uh, continued to perpetuate and frame new challenges and new problems and new ways, new methods um, as in the center. And then, um, you know, some of these other, <clears throat> what were considered foundational ideas, you know, can still inform but they're no longer the foundations. They're part of um, something. So <clears throat> I hope what I'm sh showing you is some of our very language, the way we talk about knowledge. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm gonna have to have a coffee. <clears throat> yeah. So the very language we have for talking about knowledge perpetuates the knowledge that we're talking about. So we need new language. Um, we need um, new ways of um, sort of languaging what it is we're trying to do. Because otherwise, everything we, we say we're doing, like change citation practices, I know that some of my um, colleagues would have thought, you know, oh, you're just lowering standards. You know, that's how they would, that's how they would interpret. So it's like we have to reframe the way we think about that so that we offset the criticism we know comes, you know, because it's seen as a lowering of standards, um, an attack on the integrity of, whatever this establishment is about. So it, I mean, that's the power of Western knowledge. It's it's sewn itself up in a circle <clears throat> and to bust it out, you know, you, you kind of have to create something new. And I think that's, maybe that's what people don't think about with decolonizing. So in decolonizing, they often think about what you're trying to get rid of, but don't think about what you're trying to create. Because I think that's the exciting part. What is it we're trying to create? And it's not, you know, you can say, well, I don't have time to create a whole world. But each of us has time to create a new reading list and a new, you know, way in our own behaviors of trying to practice a new citation. We can actively decenter the things that have that are seen as foundational or as core um, as the sort of you know 100 200 level every every undergraduate must understand this 
kind of knowledge. We can decenter some of the values uh, that are implicit in, in the way people are taught to understand knowledge itself, the integrity of knowledge and what that means. I think there's a whole um, ethics that needs to be taught around cultural appropriation. Um, understanding that if we're going into a new domain uh, of creating different ways of thinking about knowledge, we have to make sure that we don't simply appropriate other people's knowledge, because if we do that, then we're just perpetuating what colonialism did and, and, and doing what Edward Said has written about, you know, sort of the orientalizing the other and, and basically ripping the guts out of other people's knowledge and taking that and then telling them they don't have any knowledge, you know, that kind of, those sort of practices so that ethics, I think, is really, that's something people can start on now. You know, what is our new ethics um, of thinking about knowledge so we don't appropriate other people's knowledge? Um, and I think that's a challenge in, in, the, in the North, in, in Europe and the UK, in terms of what is it, um, what what knowledge exists outside the knowledge that is currently taught. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answers to that. And my questions might, about that might be really dumb and naive um, in the sense of, you know, I do know, because here, here you all are, you're all thinking about these things um, that there clearly are people and groups and networks who are seriously trying to address um, the matters of decolonizing inside institutions, you know, as we speak. So I know that work is going on, uh, but I also just read the other day how excited some professors were at Cambridge that, um, I think the Canadian chancellor or vice chancellor they had was leaving uh, because they thought he was undermining um, undermining the university because of his uh, belief in diversity or attempts to create diversity um, at that particular institution. So if it's to make change in institutions, like universities are really challenging. Um, I think universities are the most difficult institutions in the world to change, partly because they're filled with very smart people who are really good at arguing because they think it's all about logic um, and rationalism and science, which is what they're trained to do. But really they are the most undertrained uh, emotional beings. And so you have arguments with them which appear to be rational, but they're actually deeply emotional. And that's like every staff meeting I've ever been in a university is this sort of multi-level debate. You know, the words sound really rational up here, and then underneath, they're just fueled with this anger and this sort of blatant sort of dislike and all this other kind of emotional turmoil that's going underneath. And that's often, you know, what naively when, you know, I started my work, I kind of fell into thinking, oh, my God, I thought these like academic people were um, like reasonable they're angry, angry white men, um, <clears throat> for the most part, an uptight white woman. So it took me a while to kind of reconfigure how you strike both levels, how you kind of understand you do actually have to address their, their emotions, even though they pretend they don't have any, because they do, they have a lot of emotions. Um, so decolonial work, is 
yeah, it's political, it's philosophical, it's um, theoretical, um, philosophical, it's also pedagogical, um, it's also emotional work. And, and probably every uh, activist of colour, every activist in the diversity space will tell you uh, that the emotional labour um, of their work is huge. That, you know, they're not only doing all these other things, but it takes a toll uh, in all the other, in, in, inside them, in their spirit, it attacks their spirit. So it's spiritual work from an Indigenous perspective as well. So I'm going to take a breather. I said I'd only talk for like 30 minutes max. Um, I know it's hard to watch this via Zoom and listen intently. It's your evening. Um, the mountain range behind me, if I go like this, see that? That's my mountain on the east coast of the North Island um, of New Zealand, Hikurangi. Uh, that's my tribal territory, one of them. And um, my family have a farm under that mountain. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions and all commentary, whatever you want.